Well, for whatever reason you're here, I'm delighted you are. Since so many of you are teachers, and teachers who would come to an event like this, I assume you know that real learning doesn't come by listening. That's why in the best classrooms, kids are doing most of the talking, and teachers are expert listeners. The kids are primarily spending their time learning with and from one another and making active sense of ideas. How odd, then, that our professional development opportunities for teachers should so often reflect the worst kind of pedagogy where somebody basically lectures at you as if you are empty receptacles into which knowledge is poured. We know that's not true of kids. Why would it be true of adults? So I like to begin on almost any topic I speak about by describing a piece of research whose findings may be surprising to some people and then asking people to reflect on why the results might have come out the way they did. Tonight's study comes from a psychologist named Teresa Amabile, who, like me, lives in the Boston area. The first study I have in mind was done with 7 to 11-year-olds at birthday parties. It involved collages. Remember collages, for those of you who teach older students? The kids were all given a bunch of materials to work with and asked to create a silly collage. Half of them were just told to have fun and do it. The other half were told, this is a contest to see who can do the best collage and we will have a prize for the best collage doer. All the kids did collages and they were all collected, mixed up, and distributed to a panel of professional artists to evaluate. The artists didn't know which kids were in which groups. I don't even think they knew anything about the groups or the design of the experiment. And they evaluated the collage quality based on several different criteria. The results were quite striking. The kids who were told that this was a contest and the point was to be the creator of the best collage did collages that ended up being rated as far less creative less spontaneous, less original, less complex, less varied. A few years later, Professor Amabile, who by then had moved on for reasons known only to her, to the Harvard Business School to teach, decided to do a study with business people. Otherwise, she'd probably be booted out of that institution. And she did not dare to have the business people do collages, but she used other kinds of creativity tests that involved figuring out how to solve problems that were not immediately evident. Again, she divided the business people into two groups, those who were simply told to try to figure this out, and others who were told that this was a contest, a competition to see who could be most successful at solving the problem creatively. Despite the fact that the tasks were very different, that we were talking now about adults and not children, the results came out exactly the same way. Competition killed creativity. There's a great deal of other research that supports these two studies. But that's enough for our purposes this evening. Here's my question. Why? Why would it be the case that both for children and adults, setting people against each other to try to be the best would undermine the quality of performance, at least on creative tasks? I ask this not because I am fishing for the right answer, where these kind of questions are concerned, there isn't really a right answer. My purpose, plainly, is to engage you in informed speculation, to try to construct meaning around the question. Would you do me a favor and turn to one other person near you whom you don't know, 
Maybe that's somebody in the row in front of you or behind you. Feel free to stand up or just swivel. Find one person, take a second to introduce yourselves, and then take, let's say, a minute and a half to see if the two of you can come up with a hypothesis. Why did the kids and the adults who were thinking in terms of winning end up being less creative? Say hello. May I invite you back? I'm going to invite you in a few minutes to volunteer your reflections, should you choose to. So keep in mind any hypothesis you might have come to. I want to take a step back, though, and look at the bigger picture here before I put the experiments in a larger context. The larger context is simply this. For any given task, building a house, teaching a class, writing a book, whatever it is we're doing, cooking a meal, there's basically three ways to do it. You can do it with other people, or apart from other people, or against other people. If you do it with other people, in the purest sense, you're cooperating with them. The purest form of cooperation says that I can succeed only if you succeed too. Our fates are linked. We sink or swim together. In a sense, that is descriptively accurate of our entire world, but it is not always true of individual tasks that we perform. The second possibility is a kind of individualistic model, where I do this totally removed from your doing it, so your success, should you also be teaching a class, building a house, cooking a meal, writing a book, is unrelated to mine. Your success and my success have no connection to one another. And the third possibility is that our fates are negatively linked, so that I can succeed only if you fail, and vice versa. The question I asked a long time ago was why it is that so many of the tasks we perform in our culture, at home, at school, at work, and at play, are set up, not necessarily, but artificially in such a way, where most of us can succeed only at the price of other people's failure. And I wrote a book in my 20s about competition in all areas of human life. And I drew from many different disciplines, psychology, sociology, anthropology, biology, education, economics, and so on, to try to make sense of this basic notion that we're set against each other, to figure out why that is and whether it's necessary or desirable. I have since moved on, as Matt said, to a number of other questions and issues in education and beyond, now that I'm in my not-twenties, <laughs> and yet find myself over and over again calling back this issue and bumping up against it. So, for example, if I'm writing about the equivalent of FSAs and standardized tests in general, I find myself wondering why there would be a province-wide standardized exam. 
What is the need for standardization? Why not just learn how well kids are faring in school and how well teachers are doing by looking at authentic projects and assignments over time in a real classroom setting to qualitatively assess who needs help with what and how well we're doing. The answer when you ask the question this bluntly rises to the surface pretty quickly. The only reason you would need a standardized test that is having everybody in a huge area answer the same questions under the same conditions is if your real question was not how well are children learning, but who's beating whom? You only need a standardized test if you're more interested in victory than in excellence. Is Kelowna doing better than Vancouver? Is BC doing better than Alberta? Is Canada doing better than Finland or the US? Is my town or district outperforming yours? Only when your goal is to sort people into winners and losers do you need this form of assessment. Otherwise, you'd be doing authentic assessments where people are not always doing the same thing. And there are many other examples where we find ours, I find myself being pulled back to the same question of what I long ago called mutually exclusive goal attainment. MEGA was the acronym that failed to catch on inexplicably. <laughs> MEGA means I succeed only if you fail. In fact, there's a stronger version of it. I succeed only if I make you fail. You see the difference? If we go bowling, we take turns. I do something, then you do something, then I do something, then you do something. We don't actively interfere with each other's play. It's considered bad form in bowling to throw yourself across the lane to block the other person's ball, not to mention injurious. But if we play a game like tennis, then things are different. Because a good shot in tennis, by definition, is a shot that the other person can't get to in time and return properly. So my goal at each instant of play is to make you fail. As in war, we are actively involved in this. There, to say, as some sort of liberal, enlightened folks would, oh, go ahead and play tennis, but don't try to make the other person lose. It's just about your personal best. That's nonsense, of course, because if you played a game where you were not trying to make the other person fail, it would not be tennis. It would be perhaps another game with two rackets, a ball, and a net, and perhaps it ought to be. But the point is that if the game, and I use the game, the word game literally here, but it could be used figuratively in other encounters and activities, if the rules of the game demand that we work at cross purposes, then changing our attitudes about the activity is not sufficient. We must change the structure of the activity itself. The same thing is true of kids in school. If they find that they are in a race to beat everyone else, ooh, 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 in a game devised by the teacher called who can be the first with the right answer to be recognized by me, then the structure of the classroom sets kids against one another. Not because the kids are neurotic or malicious or sadistic, necessarily, but because the rules of the game demand that they view everyone else as obstacles to their own success. If there are awards assemblies, whatever we call them, where there's a trophy, a plaque, a certificate, some form of recognition, and we have decided in advance that not everybody can get it, 
then the message is clear. Everybody else around you is there to be beaten. If we have spelling bees, geography bees, or whatever, I don't, you don't call them that here, do you? I mean, the first game I ever learned as a child featured N children scrambling for N minus one chairs when the music stopped. At that point, when I was a kid, something called a needle was lifted from something called a record. Ask your parents about it, kids. <laughs> which made the music stop. And everyone rushed to a seat. And by design, not everybody could get one. So one kid was out. Put the music back on. Do it again. Out. Remove another chair. Out again. Out, out, out. Till at the end, you've got one kid sitting there triumphant, smug, the winner. Everybody else excluded from play, unhappy, losers. That's how you learn to have fun in North America. <laughs> it is a prototype of artificial scarcity. Along comes Terry Orlick in Ontario, Ottawa, I believe, years ago, who said, why don't we change things up a little bit? Keep the structure intact so you remove one chair each round, but change the objective. So the point is for everybody to stay seated somehow, to fit all the butts on a diminishing number of chairs. So at the end, they're figuring out how to hold on to each other and step on each other and hold and everybody plays to the end and everybody has a terrific time. I did it with both my kids at their birthday parties. I got photos sent to me from other people who've done it too and said, my God, why would we ever have a competitive birthday party? What have we been thinking? Why would we spoil the occasion by teaching children your job is to beat everybody else? You don't know how much fun competitive games aren't until you've had the chance to experience what it means to play cooperative games where you still have strategy, exercise, fresh air, not necessarily from musical chairs, but without having to turn kids into winners and losers. There are two acceptable positions in the US and Canada about competition. The first is unqualified endorsement. Competition's what made this land great. Competition motivates people to do their best. Competition builds character. And we need to start it small. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. So we might as well make it a dog-eat-dog-y -dog world with little children, too. And if you don't like competition, there's something wrong with you. Because you're scared of it and you can't handle it. That's position number one. Position number two is qualified endorsement, which says, Maybe we've gotten carried away with too much competition. We do it too intensely. We do it with children who are too young. But if we don't get carried away, if we keep things in perspective, we do it appropriately, then some competition is useful, productive, and so on. Those are the only two respectable positions to have on this topic. And that continues to be the case now. But when I began researching this topic a very long time ago, I failed to find any evidence to support the idea that competition is ever the optimal arrangement for kids especially, but even for adults at work, at home, at school, at play. Why would we need to set things up so that I can succeed only if other people fail? 
When does that ever produce optimal results compared to pursuing tasks independently or cooperatively? And so I ended up with a position that was strikingly heretical. And it's one that after having spent another few decades reading research and reflecting and becoming a parent and watching people around me and being challenged by folks who didn't agree with me, I still find myself holding to that healthy competition is a contradiction in terms. And the optimal amount of competition in any environment, especially one involving children, is none. I don't expect that most of you necessarily hold to that, but I would invite you to defend your view if you believe I've gone too far and my position is too radical. I would challenge you to say, here is a situation where we must set children against each other. So the point is to defeat their peers. Because unless we do that, we will be sacrificing something from our long-term legitimate objectives for those kids. Under what circumstances would this ever be needed? Now, when I started talking about this, it was then, as it is now, a hard sell. I was on what was then the biggest talk show in America back in the 80s called the Phil Donahue Show. This is pre-Oprah. This was the big show when, when I was booked on the show, my publicist was having orgasms. Uh, and it was... <laughs> I was asked such questions on the show as well, if you're against competition, isn't that just because you're a loser? I invite you to think of how you would answer that question in eight seconds on national television. I'll give you a hint. There is no correct answer. But as I began systematically to think about the ideas here, I found myself coming up against more and more examples of where people who say, well, we need a middle-of-the-road position, we need a balance, you know, not, not too much competition, but not none at all. And I began to realize something that takes me about 10 seconds to say, but took me many years to figure out. Not everything that's bad when done to excess is okay in moderation. Some things are bad because of what they are, not just because of how we're doing them, or overdoing them, as the case may be. But you know, we're, we're challenged in a, in a way, we're, we're, we're discouraged from asking that question. One of my favorite quotations that refers to not just competition, but other stuff, comes from the great linguist and political activist Noam Chomsky, who said the following, the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum, even encourage the more critical and dissident views. That gives people the sense that there's free thinking going on, while all the time the presuppositions of the system are being reinforced by the limits put on the range of debate. I think of that Chomsky quote with virtually every topic that I've written and spoken about. I wrote a book a few years ago about homework. You realize no research has ever found any benefit to homework of any kind for kids who are not in high school yet. Even in high school, the more research that comes in, the less reason there is to believe that we need to make children work what amounts to a second shift after having spent all day in school. No research has ever found the benefit. A, no 12-year-old should be 
forced to do a school assignment at home, let alone a six-year-old, which is beyond the pale. If we're continuing to assign it, it must be because we think they ought to have to do more assignments, not because any data suggests that it's useful. And yet, the question is almost always framed just in terms of how much, with parents saying, she's in tears. It's been a couple of hours, and she's only 10. And the idea of a bold challenge to the status quo is to have a little less homework, to cap the number of minutes. The more you argue over how much homework, the less likely you are to step back and ask, why do we need to make kids do more schoolwork at home? And why do teachers get to decide what happens during family time in the first place? The same thing is true for any number of different topics. On grades, for example, or marks, letter or number grades, the research very clearly indicates that when students are given grades in school, three things tend to happen. First, they become less excited about and interested in learning. To the best of my knowledge, every study that has ever been done on the effects of grading on motivation to learn has found a negative effect. Second, when kids are given grades, they tend to pick the easiest possible task if given a choice. Not because they're lazy, but because they're rational. Duh! I, of course I picked the shortest book. You told me that the point in here is to try to get an A, a 6, an exceeds expectations, a 100, whatever the metric is. So, of course, the easier the thing I'm doing, the better the chance I, can, I have for reaching your goal, which is not intellectual risk-taking, it's the opposite. It's risk avoidance. But then you blame me for not being motivated or having enough grit or something. It's all about me, as opposed to looking at the structure and the way it predictably elicits corner-cutting behavior because the goal is not to learn. Learning pulls in this direction. Getting a good grade pulls in that direction. That's why the best teachers I know never put a grade on any assignment they give, even if they're forced to turn one in at the end of the term. And the third effect with grades, according to the research, is that kids who are trying to work for a high grade in school tend to forget what they were taught faster and to think in a more superficial fashion, less depth, than students given the identical tasks, but in a grade-free environment. All right, so that's what the research shows about grades, and yet the only discussion educators are given in most of their pro-D days and in most articles in the journals are how to grade. Should it be standards-based grading, which is the latest fad, I didn't really understand the expression putting lipstick on a pig until I started reading about standards-based grading. Or should we put the grades online, which pushes them into the kids' faces and their parents, making them even more salient and destructive? Should we grade for effort or not? Should we include zeros or not? As opposed to taking a step back and asking, why would we be talking about how to grade when all the research, all our real-life experience, if we're open to it in actual classrooms, argues strenuously for the abolition of grades and more authentic forms of reporting that are not reduced to letters and numbers? With homework and with grades, we find ourselves thinking of this basic Chomsky principle again. We're not encouraged to ask the radical questions. And I use radical in the original Latin sense of the word. Radical comes from the Latin meaning root. We're asking the root questions, which I take it as what the zeitgeist movement is about. Not 
operating within the ideological confines of the status quo, but having some perspective and saying, are we questioning the right things? Now, in the case of competition, much of the discussion is preempted by the belief that there's nothing we can do about it anyway, because competition is just human nature. So that was the first belief I undertook to debunk. Before I wrote my book on this topic, I had heard this claim made so many times at dinner parties and in magazine articles. We're just born competitive. But I assumed there must be a significant database supporting this belief. I started the research on this 30, more than 30 years ago. I started when I was nine. Um, and I have yet to find a shred of evidence to support that belief. In fact, there's considerable evidence to challenge it from evolutionary biology, from cross-cultural anthropology, the experience of other cultures, and from elementary and early childhood education. I'll summarize it all in a sentence. We compete because we're raised that way, not because we're born that way. It's very convenient for us to say, hey, it doesn't matter what, I'd have no responsibility for changing our practices because it's innate, but innate necessarily so. There is no support for that. What we find instead is that kids are carefully taught the anthropologist Jules Henry turned his keen anthropologist's eye to our culture many years ago. He brings us inside an elementary classroom as follows. Oris had trouble reducing 12 sixteenths to the lowest terms and could only get as far as 6 eighths. The teacher asked him quietly if that was as far as he could reduce it. She suggested he think. Very helpful, isn't it? <laughs> Much heaving up and down and waving of hands by the other children, all frantic to correct him. Boris, pretty unhappy, probably mentally paralyzed. She then turns to the class and says, well, who can tell Boris what the number is? A forest of hands appears. And the teacher calls Peggy, who says that four may be divided into the numerator and the denominator. Thus, Boris's failure has made it possible for Peggy to succeed. His depression is the price of her exhilaration. His misery, the occasion for her rejoicing. To a Zuni, Hopi, or Dakota Indian, Peggy's performance would seem cruel beyond belief, but it is the standard condition of our elementary schools. I made three central arguments in my book after trying to lay to rest the idea that we have no choice about being competitive. The first was competition's effect on our psychological health and self-esteem. My bumper sticker summary of the research is the following. Competition is to self-esteem as sugar is to teeth. The meaningful distinction is not between kids who win and kids who lose. In terms of psychological health, the meaningful distinction is between kids who have to compete, and those who are blessedly free from having to compete. Competition teaches that I'm only as good as my last victory, that my sense of competence, and thus my confidence, is contingent on my having defeated other people. When you lose, it feels lousy. But even when you win, it is a shot of adrenaline that doesn't last long, and you fall back to earth and then need more and more victories to try to recover that initial euphoria, not unlike 
developing a tolerance to a drug. Competition, regardless of the results in any given encounter, encourages us to doubt ourselves and to believe that we are never ultimately successful and must always try to beat other people. To try to feel better about ourselves by winning a prize is like trying to slake a thirst by drinking salt water. It's not just unhelpful, it makes the problem worse. So the more you compete, the more you need to compete. The second issue I looked at was the effect of competition on our relationship among other people. And competition, again to summarize it succinctly, teaches children other people are potential obstacles to your success. They are not potential friends and allies and helpers. They are potential rivals whom you must best in order to succeed. And the destructive consequences, and here's really the remarkable fact, the more we see the predictable effects of competition on human relationships, the aggression, the cheating, the self-destructive behavior, especially in sports, the envy of winners, which is not a healthy emotion, the contempt for losers, the reserve and distance we find ourselves in, holding people at arm's length, because even if you're not my rival today, you might be tomorrow. All of those things happen again and again. And whenever they flare up into truly ugly behavior, we blame the individuals who were forced to compete for not knowing how to compete properly, for not having been taught sportsmanship. You don't need the concept of sportsmanship when kids are playing cooperative games. I don't just mean it's not necessary, I mean it has no meaning. It's like the concept of you don't have theft in a culture where there's no personal property, when everything is shared. The concept has no meaning. It's like in Boston, where I live, the concept of jaywalking has no meaning because there's no norm that says you're supposed to cross only at the intersections. A lot of concepts that we talk about are contingent on some other thing we've accepted whether we realize we've accepted it or not. The concept of blasphemy has no meaning if you don't believe in God. The concept of leisure has no meaning unless work is alienating. And so with competition, the idea of sportsmanship is not merely unnecessary, but without meaning, except in cases where people have been told you have to defeat him, her, or we, as a group, have to cooperate just for the purpose of defeating another group of people who are cooperating, which is as close as we get to cooperation in our culture for the most part. Let's us work together so we can beat the hell out of them sports teams, in companies, in whole countries. And yet it turns out that we're moving in the wrong direction if we think that that kind of cooperation will suffice. The research is very clear. Kids who have been led to co compete against others are less trusting. Again, duh. Why would I trust other people if I keep finding myself in activities where their success comes at the price of my failure? If I've been raised on a diet of hockey and spelling bees and which row is quietest and can go to lunch fastest and who's going to get the prize for the best essay, of course I don't trust anyone. 
It's not because there's something wrong with me. It's because adults keep making me try to beat my friends. The problem is with the structure that sets kids against each other. When is that ever likely to be beneficial psychologically or interpersonally? Not that I can find. I'm in a situation where I don't trust. The research also finds when people are led to compete, they're less able to understand how the world looks from someone else's point of view, which psychologists call perspective taking. They're less likely to help people in need, and they're less likely to communicate accurately. Again, this is not because of personality differences between kids. This is because of structural differences in terms of whether they've been put in a competitive situation. One study found that you could tell how ungenerous a child was just by how competitive the child's father was. You didn't even have to make the kid compete. Just living with somebody who's competitive was enough to make the child selfish. They didn't look at moms, but I suspect they would have found the same thing if they had. It's amazing the number of people, by the way, say, well, I'm a really competitive person, not realizing how much they're admitting to us about what's amiss, psychologically speaking. People who would never say, you know, I have a serious problem with alcohol. But by saying, I'm a really competitive person, they're saying, not I'm a person who likes to succeed. I'm all in favor of excellence. Not I'm really motivated. They're saying, I'm not satisfied until I have defeated other people. That's a sign that something is terribly wrong psychologically, but we live in a society that valorizes it instead of sending such people for treatment. <laughs> so that our mass entertainment culture, I mean, you can't turn on a reality TV show without learning the message again and again and again that the only way to cook, to design dresses, to whatever, is to try to make other people fail. The lesson being taught over and over and over again, not just with sports, is that it is necessary to win, that other people are not to be worked with, but to be worked against. And by the way, if competition were just part of human nature, would it really be necessary to do this continuous socialization to train children in this way? Or are we trying to do so without even making it plain that that's our goal. So I looked at the effect on psychological health, and I looked at the effect on our relationship, and then I looked at one more question. And this was the one that caught me by surprise. The idea that competition motivates us to do our best. Yeah, maybe it isn't so good for how we feel about ourselves, but damn it, when we're trying to win, we're much more likely to achieve great things. If we weren't competing, wouldn't we all just stagnate in a pool of mediocrity? I frankly, when I started this process of looking into this, I was already convinced before I looked at a single study that competition wasn't so great psychologically, but I assumed it had a motivational effect, so we might have to be prepared to sacrifice some achievement, at least in some arenas, in order to have happier, healthier people. I was wrong, dead wrong. The Amabile studies on collages and business creativity is just the tip of a very large iceberg. I can't even use that analogy anymore in this age of global climate change. They're shrinking, but the study pool is not shrinking, it's growing. The study, oh, now here's my bumper sticker, here's my summary on this. Competition not only isn't necessary for excellence, typically its absence is necessary for excellence. I was stunned to find this. 
At best, it provides no advantage, even in phys most physical tasks. Maybe if I took all of you and said, I'm going to make you lick envelopes. See how many envelopes you can lick in the next 10 minutes. Half of you here lick these envelopes. The other half, this is a contest to see who can lick the most envelopes in 10 minutes. You get a big prize if you lick the most. All right, I'm prepared to believe the second group would lick more envelopes. But even there, it's not clear cut. And by the way, what's the educational equivalent of licking envelopes? It's working on apostrophes. It's learning to borrow from the tens place, decontextualize skills, cramming forgettable facts into short-term memory for a test. You need to use artificial inducements like competition to make kids do stuff when the teaching is so unengaging, so traditional that kids quite understandably have been given no reason to want to learn this stuff. That's why it turns out, this is my observation, I don't have hard evidence on this, that the kind of teachers who would never have a contest in the class where they set kids against each other also tend to be the kind of teachers whose classrooms are really about intellectual discovery and understanding ideas from the inside out. The teachers who are setting kids in quizzes, like quiz bowls, and who's got the best marks on the paper, and we have a prize for who turned in the most library books earliest, who are constantly using these kind of doggy biscuits to motivate kids, especially competitions, tend to be the teachers whose curriculum and pedagogy are the least engaging, and those where the kids had the less least to say about what's going on. You show me a teacher who's using competition a lot to motivate kids, and I'll show you a teacher whose kids have probably been excluded from most of the decision-making about what they're learning, and how, and when, and why. So there's all this evidence showing in a, with adults as well as kids that competition often holds us back from doing all. You may find this radical, this may make you very angry, but I challenge you to find evidence to contradict the studies that I keep collecting showing that if I took all of you and gave you some task to perform, it's very likely that those of you trying to be number one would end up doing a poorer job. So let's come back to the collage. Why might this be true? Why did the kids at the birthday parties who were told there's a prize for best collage end up doing less creative collages? Why did the adult business people end up being less successful on average? with trying to work out creative solutions to other problems when they were told it's about winning. What did you come up with, with when I asked you a while ago to talk with somebody? Can you summarize it in one sentence, a solution? Somebody here? No, I just said, is this a contest? It is not, absolutely. No, but, but thank you for asking. Yes. It undermined creativity and problem solving because the status of winning served as a reward. Okay, which is a great way of setting the question back a step and asking, why would a reward undermine creativity? But at least now you've helped us to frame the question a little in a little more sophisticated fashion. Thank you. Why else? I think they're really to take risks. They don't want to take risks. The more focused you are on getting the prize, the less likely you are to think outside the box, to think in more unexpected ways, to play with possibilities, because you don't want to do anything to jeopardize your status of getting the reward or the award 
You know what the difference is, right, between a reward and an award? An award is a reward that everybody can't get. So it adds the arsenic of competition to the strychnine of rewards or extrinsic motivators, okay? Less risk-taking. What else? What else might be going on? What'd you come up with? Why else? Yes, and back. So there may be something about living up to others' evaluation or expectation that gets in the way, gums up the works, and prevents me from being as creative as I would otherwise be. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? Yeah? So probably in the other groups are assuming for fun, they're probably more willing to be collaborative or to share stuff or perhaps they help each other out or I'm looking, I'm seeing you're cutting out teddy bears, here's a teddy bear here, pass it on, but if it was competitive, you might not do that. You wouldn't do that. So the premise here is that for many tasks, what conduces to excellence is collaboration. As two of the leading researchers in this field put it, David and Roger Johnson, who are brothers who cooperate in the study of cooperation at the University of Minnesota, they put it this way, all of us are smarter than any of us. The most expert, a well-functioning group is often, not always, but often able to produce better results than the most expert member of the group could do on his or her own. And what happens when kids in a typical elementary school do what research shows is the most effective way of learning, learning from one another? We have another word for that. We call it cheating. Interestingly, when we use the word cooperate in most elementary schools, we, we use it to mean obedience. I want you all to cooperate, boys and girls, which means do exactly what I tell you. It's a euphemism for mindless obedience, not real cooperation. So if you're right that cooperation turns out to lead to excellence, even if the rules allow me to share what I've figured out with you and you to share with me, why the hell would we, if we're rational, do that if my success comes at the price of your failure? So the most effective means to producing or creating is ruled out in a competitive environment. Add that to the external evaluation explanation. Add that to the reward explanation. Add that to the focus on, um, not on creativity, but avoiding risk-taking explanation. And we could come up with others as well. I'm not necessarily supporting one of these over the others. And I have a bunch of, one obvious one is anxiety. I'm under stress. If I'm told I have to be the best and stress and anxiety tend to get in the way of thinking well and performing well. So whatever the reason is, though, we have all this good research suggesting that just as competition isn't good for our mental health and just as it isn't good for our relationships, it isn't even good for achievement at school and elsewhere. So then the question becomes, how do we move beyond it and how do we deal in particular? Here I'm not going to talk about the playing field, but just about the classroom. What does it mean to have cooperative learning as the default? My view is that in most classrooms, most of the time, it should be in pairs or small groups figuring out questions that matter, not just memorizing facts more efficiently, but understanding ideas together in a way that really makes sense to try to build a caring community. There is one challenge I get a lot, and I'm going to close with this. And then, by the way, we're going to take questions for a while, and I would point out that in case you came here tonight because you happen to know of other stuff I've written on other topics, I'm happy to respond to questions about anything you want. 
It doesn't have to be about competition. But there is one challenge that I hear constantly that goes like this. Well, that all sounds nice in theory. Whenever people say that, I grow suspicious. Most of these people don't even like the theory. <laughs> but in the real world, it's utopian, it's idealistic, it's unrealistic, and so on. These are challenges that people in the zeitgeist movement are well acquainted with as well. And I basically came up with half a dozen responses to this. We got to make kids compete because that's what they're going to have to do in the real world. So here they are. If one of these ever proves applicable and useful, steal it. It's yours. First, they get more than enough experience with competition without our adding more. You can't play a video game or it's damn hard to turn on TV, find some kind of after-school activity in the community without coming across one example after another of competition. It's the truly cooperative activities that are in scarce supply. So we, as educators in particular, but also as parents, have an obligation to introduce kids to non-competitive activities, given how much they already receive of this. Surely we have reached a point, even if you thought competition was useful, of diminishing returns. Second res response, I agree that in a competitive society, it is very helpful to help kids reflect on that aspect of society. I would teach children about competition, just as I would teach them about substance abuse or reckless driving. So they learn to recognize it and think deeply about the premises. But when people say we need to teach kids about competition, what they're really suggesting we do is immerse them in competitive activities, which is very, very different. We wouldn't have to do that to teach them about it. Immersing them in it by making them compete is socializing them to uncritically accept competition as inevitable or desirable. That's very different from helping them to think about what they're doing. Next, the benefits of failure are overrated. People who suggest that competing and losing is good for you because it leads you to pick yourself up and try harder next time are folks who apparently don't spend that much time with real children and seem not to have good memories about their own childhoods. The research finds that failure typically when experienced by kids, teaches kids that they don't have the competence to succeed and then become less likely to succeed next time. I have a lot more to say about this in a new book that's coming out in the spring called The Myth of the Spoiled Child, which will make a fabulous gift next spring. But. <laughs> argument is that being unsuccessful, which most people are in most competitive encounters, is rarely useful in helping people to become more successful at the activity, let alone more excited about doing it. But the next step is, even if you disagree with that and think that failure can be useful, failure doesn't necessarily entail losing which is failing in a public activity so that someone else can succeed, just as winning and succeeding are two different things. So failing and losing are. I have never seen any evidence that the particular version of failing known as losing in a competition provides any advantage in terms of kids' ultimate development. And my last response is, so often we fall back on what we could call 
what I've called the Bagudi explanation. Bagudi is a stupid euphemism, uh, not euphemism, acronym. Sorry, it's 1120. <laughs> it's an acronym for better get used to it. You say there's no evidence that grades or homework or standardized tests are beneficial to young children? Well, we've got to make them do it anyway because they're just going to get this stuff when they're older. People actually think like this. They're going to get this in high school. You've got to get them prepped now. In other words, people are going to do unpleasant things to you later, so we have to prepare you by doing unpleasant things to you right now while you're small. And that is basically the rationale for making little children compete. Yes, it destroys self-esteem. Yes, it undermines relationships. Yes, it gets in the way of excellence in many activities. And yes, it makes kids less excited about the activities themselves. But people are going to make you compete later, so start suffering now. People don't put it quite that way. But it's not that far from the actual rationale that people invoke. And you know what? I want to raise a generation of kids who don't confuse bad stuff like competition with the way the world works. Competition is not a necessary part of human life. Just like standardized tests and homework and grades aren't a necessary part of schooling. I want to raise kids so that if they get into an environment where they're set against other people and told you have to beat each other, they'll say, what the hell? Why would I do that? Things were much more successful when we were able to cooperate in the school I went with and with this amazing teacher that I had. You're going to get the duct tape stuff working just right when we're done. <laughs> Perfectly timed. I want to raise a generation of kids who look at competitive activities and say, yeah, we can do better than this. Not, that's what I'm used to. There's no other way. This is life. Realism corrupts. Absolute realism corrupts absolutely. I'm not saying live in a utopian fairy land that has no bearing on reality, competition works better, bottom line, in the real world. Cooperation is not only more successful, it gives kids a taste of an alternative way of living and learning and loving that can help our kids improve this society, improve their own lives, taking it beyond the war of all against all that we have subjected them to in the meantime.